a real privilege to be here today. It's been great hanging out with Chad, learning about Hands for Christ. Love what he's doing. I think he gave kind of a little um, testimony there about the gift of Christian rock to the body of Christ. And uh, I wanted to kind of affirm that. And I, I strongly believe that the greatest gift to the body of Christ that Christian rock offers is not evangelism. We've all probably heard stories about how we were able to tell a friend about Jesus because of a Christian rock album, or we took them to a concert and they got saved, or you know, Christian rock was used to bring somebody to Christ. And that happens, that's a real thing of fruit that happens, and you can hear stories about that a lot, but I think the biggest gift is actually pastoral. You know, what does a pastor do? A pastor equips Christians for works of ministry, and to put it crudely, a pastor keeps them saved, a pastor keeps them fed, it keeps them growing. When you're equipped for ministry, you're actually doing something for God, and God kind of gets involved with that, and the, the, like the life of a plant, you're growing as you're doing these things. And so the work of a pastor is equipping for gifts of ministry and keeping and a, you know, a shepherd, the shepherd's sheep, he feeds them, he nourishes them, he keeps them healthy. And that's what Christian Rock does. Like for tons of Christian kids, uh, they get to hear sermons a lot of times put to really great music. And so it serves a pastoral role. And uh, not only does it bring people to Christ by the droves, but even in bigger numbers, I think it, it far overshadows it, but hardly anybody talks about it is the pastoral gift that Christian Rock is to the body of Christ. Thanks for bringing that up because I think that's really um, exciting about what Christian Rock has done. And, you know, Christian Rock over time has, has really grown. There's been some different stages. In the early days, uh, a lot of hippies got saved and they were making Jesus rock. And they just wanted to take the language of their youth and the language of their generation and use that language as a medium to spread the message because Jesus changed their lives they wanted to tell their peers about it, and so they just naturally used an art form that was that they knew. And Jesus Rock grew and grew and grew, and the Jesus Movement was a modern-day revival that a lot of us saw that happened in the late 60s and early 70s. It spread like wildfire, and before long, the popularity of these Christian concerts and their music was, there was some real talent out there, like Phil Kagan in the second chapter of Acts and Love Song. Larry Norman, Randy Stone, all these people were making quality music. And so some fellows came along and said, I'd like to bring a business model to that to help further that. And that was kind of the idealistic view behind that is we will be a partner with these artists and help their message get spread and we'll kind of quantify things. We'll put out albums and we'll make it available as a product. And so that's kind of how the Christian music industry got started. It was pretty much started within the church. And, you know, there's a lot of criticism that could be made of the Christian industry. You've probably all heard a story of an artist who was upset or something went wrong in their career and they, they maybe became bitter and jaded as a result of their experience. But by and large, uh, it was a bunch of, you know, naive and well-meaning guys coming along. But what they used for their models, unfortunately, was sometimes just the standard recording artist contract that goes way back to like the 20s when they were taking advantage of some uneducated musicians and just giving them a one-sided deal. And as a side note, the, the art of negotiation is most people come to the table with their lowball offer, and as they barter, they get to a higher offer and come to an agreement. And a lot of these contracts were like lowball offers, and the artists didn't know any better, so they signed these deals that locked their career up for seven albums and gave them very little bit of money in return for their art. But anyway, the Christian music industry grew. In spite of that, the business machine helped it flourish and a lot of people have been edified by that. And I started a magazine in 85. I was a college student at the University of Texas. And my story is kind of a prodigal son story. I got saved at age 11. Uh, I'm an old guy now, in case you haven't noticed. But uh, so back in 74, when I was 11 years old, I got saved. I probably went forward to an altar call. It was probably about the rapture. Back then, the most popular message was, you better get right uh, before the rapture happens or you'll be left behind. And as a little 11 year old, I took that seriously and came to Christ and really, uh, to the best of my ability, gave him my heart. And I, I bore a little bit of fruit. I had the privilege of leading two of my best friends to Christ. I remember being out in the woods with them and wanting to carve a knife and kind of carve the moment on a tree or something. And I was reading the word a lot. I was going to church. I was learning about worship and growing. And for one reason or another, after about six months, I kind of fell away from the Lord. Just kind of slowly but surely, kind of started walking. Um, my own journey and uh, you know picked up pornography and was listening to rock music 
Um, that's about the extent of my badness. I wasn't involved in drugs or a lot of crazy things or breaking the law uh, as a youngster. But for nine years, I, I walked away from the Lord slowly but surely. And gradually, I got to be more extreme sinning as far as dramatic sins go, like taking drugs and stuff like that. Um, and so through the influence of a close friend who was actually, he had come to Christ the year before as a prodigal himself. I met him on a summer job the summer before. So that summer, between my sophomore and junior year, um, through his influence, and he was praying for me, he was fasting for me, he was weeping over the condition of my soul in prayer. And he was sharing with me things about Jesus that I knew and respected and all of us in America pretty much have heard before, but also a few things that were intriguing that made me want to dig into scripture. Like, where was Jesus during the three days, you know, when he preached to the prisoners? What does that mean? So things like that really got me intrigued into the Bible. And so um, like the prodigal son, I kind of embraced God again. And for the first time, just really experienced that, that, that love and that grace and being washed and coming home the next day. My dad showed me in his prayer journal. He's been praying for me every day of my life since he was a believer. And he'd been praying for a Christian friend. And Christian Rock was a big part of that. And so I was 20 years old when I came back to Christ and came back to the University of Texas. I, I live in Austin, in that area. And when I came back there, I was uh, really excited about, you know, listening to Christian Rock and learning about Christian Rock where I could. And a couple years later, I was reading an underground fanzine called Acme, which stood for Alternative Christian Music Enthusiast. And it said in passing, you know, with the advent of Christian heavy metal, somebody should start a Christian metal newsletter or fanzine. You'll have a lot of fun along the way. And I thought I could do that. And so for about five or six months, I kind of let the idea bounce around in my brain. The vision kind of gelled and talked to some friends about using the equipment at school to print my first issue. And a good friend of mine was going to a big festival in Illinois called Cornerstone. He said, I'm going to go up there. Why don't you print your first issue and I'll hand it out as a promotion. And it turns out that was like the shove out the front door that got me going and I was able to get in on the ground floor of a movement Christian heavy metal in the 80s just exploded and grew and somehow I got on the ground floor of that and was able to grow with it a little bit what's funny about that first issue is it's so crude it was just like a couple pages of Xerox paper uh, folded together and taped in the middle and my friend was so embarrassed over the quality and he only handed out two of them I gave him like about 30 copies and he was just so embarrassed over the quality they kind of sheepishly he gave one to Glenn Kaiser and Res Band and somebody else but in spite of all that it was able to grow and I started doing interviews a lot and eventually I uh, came upon the idea through coincidentally Cornerstone Festival is part of a group called Jesus People USA and these were a bunch of hippies who got saved again and they would travel around mostly a lot of times they traveled through the south like down in Florida and they had a bus or two I think they just had wound and they would fan out and they would would pass out flyers and say, hey, there's gonna be a concert in the park tonight, why don't you come? And they would pray with people and evangelize and the the Resurrection Band would play a concert or some other musicians would play a show and then they would present the gospel and people would get saved. And that was what they were doing, Jesus people. And they ended up in Chicago and their bus broke down and they had the hardest time getting it fixed and they finally found a church that would let them sleep in the basement for a while while they got their bus fixed and through one happenstance after another they realized you know I think God's trying to tell us something and they sunk their roots down and they've been in Chicago ever since Um, and they put on the Cornerstone Festival now but they started kind of a free paper called Cornerstone and they used to interview uh, you know quote unquote secular secular means non-sacred so it's kind of a popular term for Christians to refer to non-Christian artists as secular as opposed to sacred they would interview secular artists like Ozzy Osbourne and kind of witness to them in the interview and I remember they would offer, at the end of the interview, they'd go, here's a copy of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. I encourage you to read it. And how can we pray for you? And hopefully we'll see you again next time you come through town. So that really inspired me. I thought I'd like to do that sometime. And so over the next few months, I uh, endeavored to do that. And one thing that was great about becoming uh, a magazine and growing in stature and having retail distribution, being found in stores, is once you become a media outlet, you don't have to really dig for news anymore because the news comes to you. The, the, the news outlets and the, the people that are paid to get publicity or press, i.e. publicists, it's their job to find the media outlets and funnel them information. So that was good for me because the news started coming to me and I would get a press release, you know, say the Shotgun Messiah has a new album coming out, here's a copy and here's a little bio or information about the band, interview requests are being taken here, 
So all I'd have to do is call somebody up or send them an email and say, yes, I'd like to interview that artist. And so that's how this whole process of the What So-and-So Says interviews started. And I called it What So-and-So Says from the beginning because I knew I wanted it to be an ongoing series and you would just kind of fill in the blank of whoever I was interviewing. You know, what Extreme says, what Kiss says, what Metallica says. And, uh, and it quickly became the most popular part of the magazine. And for years after that, people would say, you know, you ought to collect these interviews and put them in book form. That would be a cool book. And I took their encouragement to heart and put together a galley version. At that time, I had like a little over 100 interviews with these secular rock stars. And I put them together in kind of a rough draft book form, which was called a galley. And I uh, come up with a letter called a query letter. And in the business of uh, writing for newspapers and media, um, in magazines, they'll tell you to submit to an editor what's called a query letter. It's a one-page letter. You can stick to one page because these people are busy and they get query letters all the time. And so you need to get to the point quick, tell them the story, why you picked their magazine, why your story would fit their magazine, and why, it's, why they should respond to you. And in my query letters, I would say, you know, if you want to read the galley version, just let me know. And I sent out six of those, and I got back six rejection letters. Dear Mr. Van Pelt, thank you so much for your idea. We don't think it would fit our publishing company right now. But the seventh publisher was a, a relatively new book company called Relevant Books, which was a branch of Relevant Magazine, which is a very popular magazine, kind of for 20-somethings. Um, and so they put out, uh, my book was called Rock Stars and Jesus. And I even had, a, on my galley version, I had an illustration of Jesus riding on the front of a bicycle bar. Uh, I told a friend of mine who's, a, who's an artist and likes to draw about this vision I had. One day I was riding to school, and I just imagined in my imagination Jesus riding on my handlebars in his robe and just kicking up his feet and going woohoo and just laughing and having a good old time. And it was kind of a neat picture in my mind of just the joy of Christ and what he must be like as a, as a human. Um, and... Um, but anyway, so they wanted to change the name from Rock Stars and Jesus to Rock Stars on God. And instead of 100 interviews, they wanted to trim it down to 20. And they picked 20 of the most popular, biggest names, like the Get Up Kids, Alice Cooper, Henry Rollins, Metallica, Kiss. And it's very exciting. It came out in 04, um, sold some copies. Um, and it was really neat to kind of hold something in your hand you'd worked on so hard and, and break it into the book market was kind of a fun, a new thing for me. And uh, relevant books slowly went out of print. They uh, just kind of got overwhelmed. But if you become a, a record company or a book company or something to that nature, sometimes you can grow too fast. And sometimes you can get beyond your means of trying to keep up with the momentum you've built. And I don't know if that's the case with them. It, it might describe their situation, but they cut back on their book line. And I opted out of my contract and got permission to take the series on myself. So. That's what brings us to Rockstars on God Volume 2, which came out last week. And uh, I'm really excited to be here because uh, I did a fundraising campaign, and one of the levels of participation uh, in, in funding a project like a book, like for a certain amount, you'll get a copy of the book signed, and a certain amount, I will come and I will read the book to you and teach a class or a seminar to you and your friends about interviewing and book publishing and magazine publishing. So that's why I'm here today. And I want to kind of mix a little bit of uh, some kind of practical instruction on some of the things I do or have done, as well as tell some stories that you might remember, and then have some time for question and answer. And I know that uh, Chad encouraged you to think of some questions. If you have a question and you know yourself too well and know you'll forget, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I don't have something that's just so important and so set in stone that I can't stop and pause and get back on track. So if you have a question, you think you might forget it later on, or. Uh, feel free to just slip your hand up and uh, interrupt me when the question comes. You maybe uh, I'll cover different points and you'll have a question over each point. So as I transition on, maybe that'll be a time you want to ask something about that. 